Aloha and welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate. I'm Will Tanaka with my co-host, business partner and wife, Leonie Lam. Thanks, Will. Will and I work as a team to bring you the latest in Hawaii real estate. And we are thrilled today because we are welcoming attorney at law and longtime real estate instructor, Scott Bly. Scott actually owns the Bly School of Real Estate, and he literally wrote the book that all real estate practitioners study to take the state licensing exam. So we are super thrilled to have Scott with us today. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. It's really a privilege to be here. I appreciate it. We are so grateful. And, you know, from your real estate and legal perspective, what are your observations or opinions and what you're currently seeing today in Hawaii's real estate market? Well, I'm very fortunate to um, do a lot of um, I draft, what I do for a living um, as on the legal side is I draft a lot of documents. Uh, the primary documents I draft would be probably like deeds and uh, assignments and mortgages and things like that. So I, I'm very lucky to be able to see a real wide variety from different escrow companies and different real estate agents as well about what's happening. And um, so what I'm seeing is happening presently is that, um, you know, there's there's a change in our market in, in Hawaii. Um, and I think a lot of people are aware of that. Uh, but our market has always been, you know, very good in Hawaii. It's just that we have that this real estate um, settlement that's been going on. And because of this, I'm seeing a lot of more creative uh, financing um, mm -hmm. because we know the interest rates, you know, have been historically low for so long. Uh, so once they went up, uh, people like were like shocked and like, oh, my gosh, you know, I, I don't want to get involved with this. And so I think what's happening right now, which, you know, isn't a bad thing. We're seeing a lot more creativity and um, so I'm able. So when I draft my documents, I'm. I'm, I'm seeing from different companies, you know, what what different ones are doing in the market. And it's really kind of interesting how that's playing out. Hey, Scott. So in terms of creative financing, so yeah. typically, you know, we have clients who are just getting the conventional mortgage where they might put anywhere from 5% to 20% down. They're you know, obtain a loan from a local bank or from a local brokerage with from a national lender. But when you're talking about creative financing, can you just unpack that in the simplest terms, if at all possible, for sure. our viewers? Sure. There's there's a couple different ways. So the one that's common and that I like that that's really, um, you know, everything's on the up and up, and that that's with regarding the assumptions of loans. Um, mm. What an assumption is is when another party is taking over the loan from the original party um, it, with assumptions in general with a definite definitionally with assumptions is both the original party and the new party will have liability so meaning um if one party doesn't pay the other party has to pay but what's happened with these va assumptions well, that's veterans administration well these you know and they're the ones that we're seeing the assumptions a lot of but VA actually requires what they call innovation. Innovation is uh, having the original uh, party that's taking the loan out. The original party actually is being released from liability. So even though under assumptions itself, that doesn't necessarily happen, with VA loans, it's required to happen. And so you're the new buyer that's buying this VA property. And, and it doesn't even have to be um, a, a veteran that's buying. Um, if, if, if it's a non-veteran, then the certification of eligibility um, can't be used by the veteran if it's already be being used by the new buyer. Mm. But, but, but either way, with the assumptions, uh, this new buyer is able to buy the property and assume the original loan, and then the original party is being released of liability. And so when I draft these deeds regarding this, there's just special language that's required to put in these deeds. So that's the good okay. one. That, that's the one that's really on the up and up, and I, I really like that. But I have to say there is 
something that's happening right now that's um, a little concerning to me. And we're also seeing people um, selling their property subject to the mortgage loan. And the reason that I feel this is a little bit concerning, uh, and, it's, and it's concerning for the seller, not, not the buyer, but what the seller is selling it subject to a mortgage loan, what that means is the buyer is actually buying the property and that loan is not getting paid off. And, and when you have a loan, there's actually two different documents. There's a promissory note and there's the mortgage. The mortgage mm -hmm. actually is a document that secures the promissory note. So what happens here with the, with the mortgage is there's a clause in it. It's either called the alienation clause or the due on sale clause. What this clause means is whenever the property is transferred or sold, then the lender at the lender's option can mm -hmm. make the loan be all due and payable. And that's really detrimental to the seller. But some, so the, the, the reasons this is okay. happening is when yeah. the sellers are like in a desperate situation. Maybe they just bought a property and they don't have a lot of equity. And let's say they got transferred to a different state. Um, maybe they're in the military or something got transferred. And so what's happening is the sellers actually allowing themselves to sell the property, still being on the hook on the loan, and the mortgage still stays with the property because the loan's not being paid off. Um, and then the buyer doesn't have any personal liability because the personal liability through the promissory note is still with the original seller, which is called who's called the you know the um, mortgage or. Yeah. I mean, that, that's getting really creative. And just to put it in context, you know, you started off with talking about the VA assumption. So, yeah. you know, during COVID 2020, 2021, yeah. 2022, the interest rates, I mean, I've seen VA loans at 2.75%, yes. 3.1%. I mean, I mean, and compared to today, it's 6%. So when there's an opportunity for a prospective buyer to assume the loan at that same rate, the 2.75, the 3.0%, I mean, that would be a great benefit to any new buyers. But of course, there's yes. a process for that. And then you help everyone with that process. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's fun to be part of it. And again, I like with assumptions because that's on the up and up. But I yeah. have to tell you, when it comes to taking subject to a mortgage loan, what happens sometimes that's is, scary yeah. it is scary and, and the sellers get me involved and they're like saying scott you know can you help me i'm like well there's not a lot i could do what i so what i what i have done because it's the only thing really that i can do to help them is i've been drafting like a promissory note um that having the borrower the you know the buyer uh assign that saying that they're going to pay back to the seller because without that promissory note there's no tie from the buyer to the seller for the buyer to be paying back, um, you know, the, the seller because the seller was the one that's you know liable to the lender to the mortgagee. Is there anything else? Any other changes? Because you know, initially you mentioned something about like in Hawaii, a bad market is still a good market compared to the mainland. Yeah, I mean, we're very fortunate really to be in, to live in Hawaii. I've always believed that. And, you know, even coming out of the recession back in uh, November of 2008, we were, you know, the first state to come out of it and come out the quickest. And we were in the recession, the shortest. Um, uh, really across the world, um, Hawaii is a place where a lot of people, you know, fantasize about want, you know wanting to live here and be here and so we ha we really have a built-in market like the especially like the asian market that the mainland doesn't doesn't really have that and i've even read uh, articles where they're considered to be hawaii the number one real estate market in the united states and that didn't surprise me at all so e even when it's a bad market uh, hawaii will do fine and what's happening now, which is kind of exciting for me, is we're seeing a change. And because of this change, we're seeing people get creative in different ways. Yeah, there's going to be some bad ways, but, you know, there's also some very good ways. And, and I, I like to see that. And I think what might happen in the long run is it, it may weed out 
um, you know, some agents and, you know, ones that may be just doing it temporarily. Um, but I definitely think that's going to happen. But anytime there's change, I, I think the consumer gets, you know, all, you know, scared and nervous, you know, oh my gosh, there's change. But change is inevitable, right? It's, you know, um, dynamic, not static. It, it will always happen. And I think we've just had the biggest change that we've seen in real estate, I don't know, probably in my lifetime, actually. And because of that, I think some people have gotten very scared. Um, but I think it's a good thing. I think now, you know, we're like a lot of other markets. Um, mm -hmm. Because one thing that I have seen is that, um, like in the oil industry, both in the oil and airline industry, um, there was price fixing you know, a violation of the Sherman antitrust law, a federal antitrust law. And and I, I don't want our industry to be price fixing. And really, that's what it was leading to when sellers were actually, you know, selling their homes and um, paying commissions. And there was an automatic splitting with the buyers. So meaning there really wasn't a choice for the seller. And so there's nothing wrong with splitting commissions with the buyer, but what was wrong was that it was, you know, it was required. I mean, it wasn't like a choice for the seller. So right. I love, I love now that we have this market going forward where the seller does have more options. If they want to pay for the buyer, good for them, right. but it won't be considered to be price fixing. I think it's important for our industry uh, to stay clean, and and I want us to, you know, we're we're all in the industry. You, we want our industry, to, you know, to look good for sure. And I I want to kind of, you know, roll back to that point about, you know, there have been practice changes due to the National Association of Realtors settlement, and so we are definitely in practice and and in you know understanding what those what the impacts are. So one of them would be, and I wanted to get your take on it, but for the sellers, you know, like you're saying about price fixing, and now they have the opportunity to either pay the buyer's agency's commission or not, or negotiate it and this and that, which was always the case, but it's very clear now with the practice changes, maybe like an unintended sort of consequence could be, you know, an unrepresented buyer, for example, yes. because if they're unable to, you know, or if they, they're, they, they go directly to the, to the seller's agent, or it could be dual agency where there's a single yes. agent that is already representing the seller and selling their property. And then now an unrepresented buyer comes to them and says, hey, can you help me and represent me too? So in the case of the single agent dual agency, you know, we know that it's completely legal to do in the state of Hawaii. But um, what are your thoughts about that, like single agent dual agency and and how does that impact a consumer? Yeah, I, I would have to say for like 20 years, I've been really fighting against a single agent dual agency. And, and I, I'm just going to go off topic for a moment because I just want to relate it to my law practice. Um, I used to be a trial attorney. And one thing I did was divorces, uh, which I'll, I will never do a divorce again. Thank, thank goodness I don't have to. But there was one time where this couple were friends of mine and the wife wanted me to represent her. And the husband wanted me to represent him. And legally, I can do that. But ethically, because our standards should be higher ethically than legally, that there's no way it would do that. The reason I'm bringing that scenario up, because that's how I equate it to dual agency. Because what's happening is when you're, when you're the only agent, your client is paying you to put their interests first. You know, you're in a fiduciary relationship. And in this fiduciary relationship, the expectation is you're looking out for your client. And what happens if you're in a dual agency? That means you're representing both sides. And so that therefore your role becomes more of a facilitator um, instead of like a proponent for your client because they're both your clients. And so I, you know, I ask agents when they do that, are you doing this? for your benefit or for your client's benefit? Because I think sometimes, uh, many times, you're doing it for your own benefit. And that's really breaching the fiduciary obligation because our, you know, our job is to put our clients first. 
You know, that, that's what people are hiring us for. So when you're the only agent, um, I don't think that's possible. Um, let me tell you, if someone came to me and wanted me to represent them, I would not represent both sides. Now, when it comes to having different agents, um, I don't have the problem with that if you have different agents under the same umbrella. So just to, just to let everybody know that's watching is a dual agency means that um, you're the company, the brokerage firm is representing both sides, no matter if they're different agents or not. That's actually what dual agency is. Um, but with dual agency, if it's if 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 you're only representing one side and you have another agent rep, rep, representing one side, um, then my advice would be for agents to also make it a designated agency. The the term designated designated agency is like a legal fiction, in that it's still a dual agency. So it still is a dual agency. However, what happens is you have an agreement that the one side, like the buyer or the seller, they're represented by different agents and different brokers in charge so that there's no collusion involved because that's what you don't want to have happen. And the courts, even though, you know, obviously the courts are not uh, favorable toward dual agency, but even less favorable if it's not a designated agency. Because if you're the same agent on both sides, yeah, good luck in court because you're going to be on the losing side either way because one side's going to lose. And since you're on both sides, you will be on the losing side. Yeah, so I think that was definitely an unintended sort of thing that sellers will be facing as they go forward with selling their properties due to the practice changes because that might be the an unrepresented buyer, the single agent, dual agent. And so in some cases, it looks like for a seller, entertaining paying the buyer's brokerage might be a form of liability insurance almost. Do you, do you feel like that's valid? I do feel that's valid. Um, and, and let me mention too, with this, uh, with a rep unrepresented buyer, because, um, you know, again, anyone that's listening out there, um, when you're, when, when, when you're buying a house conceivably, it's probably the largest transaction you're doing in your life, uh, you know, money-wise. And so I don't think it would be prudent not to have real estate representation and or legal representation. Um, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, may, may perceive that real, you know, they might not know the real estate agent's value. And, um, I also want to share this as well, because I think this will help. I, I, I've been very fortunate to be able to practice law in two different jurisdictions. And um, like 25 years ago or 30 years ago, I practiced um, on the mainland law and also, you know, a real estate law, uh, much like here in Hawaii. But it's a, it was totally different. It was really... I loved actually the practice on the mainland um, with the real estate because what happened is the buyer's uh, agent would come to my office and have me, the, the, the buyer and the seller have already come up with, you know, what they want in the contract. And the attorney's job is to put it together um, how they want it. Um, and then the real estate did, you know, they did their job of, you know, helping the, the clients. I did the legal uh, part of it. So my hope is that perhaps more in Hawaii will see that, that people, because it's not one or the other. A lot of people think, oh, if you have a real estate agent, you don't need an attorney, or if you're an attorney, you don't need a real estate agent. And you need both because it's different functions that are provided or different skill sets that are provided by each professional. Yeah. And I actually loved working with the agents. And so that's you know that that's what kind of makes it exciting for me is that um, to see what's going to be happening in, in this in Hawaii, um, as well as you know the rest of the country, is there's change and you know I feel like we need to make the most of the change, and we have this opportunity, this golden opportunity to be on the forefront of something, 
and to put ethics first and look out for the client. And um, so to me, it's an extremely exciting time. I feel like you brought up something really important because when you're talking about the mainland versus Hawaii, yeah. there are states on the mainland that are attorney states versus Hawaii yes. is an escrow yes. state. And there are states that are also escrow states in the mainland as well. Right. But can you kind of, so I think when you're describing sort of the services that you provided when yes. you were helping real estate transactions yes. in the mainland, was that was that in fact a attorney state versus an escrow state? Yes, you're exactly right. In fact, uh, this is kind of, you, you're going to think this is funny. I didn't even know what escrow was. <laughs> <laughs> Because I grew up on the East Coast and there's no escrow on the East Coast. Attorneys do it all. Yes. So it wasn't um, until later on that I got familiar with escrow. So yeah, I mean, agents would love this. So what would happen is, uh, again, the agent would come to my office, really, and just tell me what they want in the contract. The agent is then out of the picture. They might be doing the little things with their clients, with information. I mean, I, I don't know because... I'm doing the legal part. So so then I kind of carry the ball forward from there all the way to the closing. Even as an attorney, I would do the closing. Um, but I have to say, because I work with so many escrow companies in the state of Hawaii, and I absolutely love working with escrow. I really do. They're, they're so helpful. And we're so lucky to have these wonderful escrow companies that we do have. And they help my job make it a lot easier. But one thing that I, I do hope we can get across is that, you know, we do need both professionals. I think sometimes people, because I've had agents tell me this, they've actually told clients, um, oh, you don't need an attorney. And, and that's really bad advice. I, I would never say you don't need a real estate agent because again, they both perform different functions. And um, so that's what I'm hoping we're going to see more of. So maybe the buyer you know, this unrepresented buyer will either get legal help um, or real estate help. And actually, I had one transaction already like that. And I worked with an agent and I really enjoyed it because that very much made me feel like on the mainland, how we how we used to work together. I just think what's happened now in Hawaii, we, that's just not been our custom. So I think it's just something we have to get used to. And I think it will benefit everybody. You know, yeah. if the agent and the attorney work together, and I, I, I love it, and um, yeah, and and I do think you know, you again, you need the professionals. Like, you know, outside of law, I have no talent. So uh, no matter what I do, I always get a professional involved, and and I, you know, it's the same way with uh, with buying a house. I think that's really, really critical. Hey Scott, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah. Okay. Because like yeah, because you could handle your own transaction, I'm sure. But I can. The on the spot question is: Have you used a realtor in the past, and if so, and also would you use a realtor in the future to buy or sell property? I have used a realtor in the past, and I would in the future. I mean, again, we have different. There's different yeah. expertise out there. You know, when when I teach the students. I understand that you know it's, it's a different skill set with selling than is for me like doing my legal work, and mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the, the public has to be aware of that too. I mean, it's completely different skill set, yeah. um, but absolutely, I you know well what's what's that saying? Like if you represent yourself, you have a fool as a client, <laughs> and um, yeah, so my. My mother didn't raise no fool, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, th thanks for l letting us uh, put you on the spot. So in terms of, you know, the legal uh, document size with the deed, yeah. line yeah. for petitions, yes. and I mean, th there's so much stuff that we could talk about, but let's say just as an example, right? Okay. There's, uh, we have a lot of first time home buyers, a young couple, they're not married. They want to home, they want to purchase a home together. And in terms of, you know, if the question was, how do we hold title? Because, you know, we're a couple, we're in love, not married yet. What are the options? Yeah. And, and first of all, I want to say out there again to the audience that I mean, if that's a situation of yours, you know, you do want to go to legal 
and for this. This is a legal question. Um, real estate agents can't answer that question or escrow because um, it, it, it kind of is a legal question. So it really would depend a lot of things. So one would be um, if people have been married previously, um, the second I mean, that's always uh, a concern because they might want to hold title differently if they've been married before. So really, if um, if there's a couple, so let's say, because you were saying a, a married couple, or, uh, not did you say married or unmarried? Unmarried. Unmarried, unmarried couple. They want to so buy a, a property with an unmarried together, yeah. couple, there's, there's really two options. Um, there's a joint tenancy, and then there's a tenancy in common. In the United States, I'll, our default provision is tenancy in common, meaning if you didn't state anything regarding tenancy in a deed, if somehow attorney forgot, it would automatically be tenancy in common. So a tenant in common is you actually have this share, well, let's say yourself, and it can be whatever percentage. It's the only tenancy that allows um, unequal interest. And sometimes, like with a couple, um, they might want that because maybe one of them put in 80% of the funds. And then the other one put in 20% of the funds. So they might say, okay, if I put in 80% of the monies, then I want to be a tenant in common to 80% of this property. And that makes sense. So, you know, when someone comes to me, I, I want to hear their story because I want to know why they want what they want or um, and in order to help advise them. So as far as a joint, the joint is most beneficial at the end. And I say that because with a joint tenancy, it involves a right of survivorship. So what this right of survivorship means is when one tenant dies, it goes automatically to the other tenant. And that happens um, at death. So it makes it very easy for a transfer to happen when someone dies. Otherwise, like if there's a trust involved, um, they'll have to go through the trust. If there's a will involved, they'll have to get probated. So there's these extra steps that you know would would happen unless you had it with a right of survivorship. And then I know earlier, um, speaking of death, not that we want to talk about death, but you had mentioned the importance, or not a lot of people know about the transfer on death deed. So as we kind yeah. of wind down a little bit, um, yeah, can I, we I, I touch up on that real quick? I sure, certainly, I love talking about the transfer and death deed. Yeah, so guys, with, with a deed, a deed is your document that um, transfers title. Title is your um, interest in the property. And so your your actual document is, is called a deed for fee simple property. And fee simple is, it covers everything because we also have leasehold in Hawaii. So with a fee simple property, the deed is uh, the document that would be used. And um, and then for we also have for leasehold a, a document called the assignment. And generally, deeds are recorded, but guys, deeds are not by law required to be recorded. But generally, you will record it. But this particular deed, the transfer and death deed, uh, that's one thing that's different. Uh, one is that it's required to be recorded. The other with a transfer on death deed is that it's the only deed that's revocable, which I love. So what that means is if it's revocable, it's in your control. And if it's in your control, that means that, um, you know, it's, it's part of your estate. So it doesn't become, uh, go to the other party until you've died. So that's why the transfer on death deed, they use different terminology. In, in a regular deed, you'd have grantor and grantee. In a transfer and death deed, uh, you have transfer or that would be your grantor, and your grantee would be the called the beneficiary. Because with a beneficiary, that happens later on, unlike a grantee, so they can't use that same name. Uh, because what happens with a transfer and death deed, it doesn't transfer until you die, but then it transfers automatically. That's what I like about it because with a uh, with a will or a trust, you can actually challenge the will. You know, you've heard of contest. You know, people contest a will. Um, you can also, you know, do the same with a trust. But with a deed, because it's required to be recorded, 
it's already required publicly. And we do that in Hawaii at uh, a place called the Bureau of Conveyances. So at the Bureau of Conveyances, uh, this deed is recorded. Well, let's say that I want to sell the property like a year later and change my mind. Very easy. I can just revoke it. And that's just a, a paragraph I would put in my new deed. And that's it. And it just is really nice and tidy. And some people are saying, oh, but you have to wait 18 months um, for, for uh, title to uh, insure it. Well, the same goes for the trust. It's an 18-month waiting period for a trust. If you don't advertise you know, that this person has died, which most people don't, um, then that too has an 18-month waiting period. So I really, really like it. It's really a way <laughs> to allow real property be, be, to be transferred like automatically. Because as you notice, we have a lot of these accounts for personal property called payable on death accounts. And uh, I would say almost every state has payable and death accounts now. And that makes it really easy to transfer real property, uh, personal property. But this allows you to, to transfer real property essentially the same way. The bottom line is there are many, many, there's, there's so much depth of information and knowledge that you have, Scott. And we appreciate your time. We're so grateful that you shared with any viewer that's watching this. We covered a myriad of different topics. Oh my gosh. Guys. <laughs> Is the time up already? You know? Even let us put you on the spot and you're just speaking from the heart and your heart is to elevate and continue to perpetuate greatness within the Hawaii real estate industry. And you do it through education and through your own good works on the legal side of things. And so we just appreciate and value you tremendously. And we just want to thank you so much for being on Inside Hawaii Real Estate. Well, thank you for having me. Anytime you want to have me back, it would truly be a pleasure for me. Thank you, Scott. Thank You're you welcome. very much. And aloha. Aloha. Thank you, Bye. Scott. Bye.